Yeah, well, let's get the show on the road. Before before I uh, I hand things over to, to Dave Bender, um, it's it's become uh, common practice uh, where where I am in, in Canada, and I think a lot of places in North America and around the world to start any kind of formal occasion with a land acknowledgement. Uh, usually, I'd be talking about the 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 people who were originally on the land um, that, um, that that I'm on in Canada, uh, who are the Haudenosaunee and uh, other members of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. Today, I have the pleasure of being in Colorado, um, this, which has a different Indigenous history uh, that I've learned a little bit about today. One of the key aspects of a land acknowledgement is to make sure that it's not pro forma, that you're not rattling it off. Right, it has to be. It has to be something that you do in a very um, mindful, we might say, deliberate way. Um, and so, I am on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and many other Native American nations. I apologize if I butchered any of those names. The the Arapaho are um, a nomadic tribe that have, uh, I think, sometimes since split into the north and south tribes um, calling parts of Colorado and Wyoming their home. And so I just want to express gratitude for this, this wonderful land and uh, gratitude to all of you for being here as well. And with that, I will pass it on to Dave. Dr. Clark uh, received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto in 1993, his doctorate in social psychology from the University of Waterloo in 1999. So it only took you six years. Yeah. He was then a postdoc at Cornell, took his first faculty position at the University of Windsor in the year 2000. In 2002, he became a faculty member at the University of Guelph where he is now department chair. He's conducted research on a number of topics. I'll not list all them for you, but more, most recently his interests have shifted to flow of consciousness, theoretical and philosophical issues in psychology and using a descriptive psychology approach in his work. Ian also recently has become a student glider pilot. So we're gonna fly a bit with him tonight. And uh, he's going to take us into the uh, into the land of uh, merging descriptive into the mainstream of psychology. So help me welcome Dr. Clark. <laughs> for that for that introduction, I, I I do know that I'm a student glider pilot. So if I'm going to be flying anywhere, one of you would need to be a qualified pilot sitting behind me. So if you are one, you might want to get up here. Um, so uh, let's get on with the talk. Here we go. As the title says, the time is probably ripe for change. Uh, I want to talk to you about moving descriptive psychology into the main uh, into the mainstream. Let me give you a brief overview of, what, of where I want to go with this. Um, and I should note from the start that this is this is the kind of talk, and those of you who've been to my talks before uh, know that I very much value exchanges as the talk unfolds. I want you to ask questions. I don't care if I get off track. We've got we've got an hour and a half. Um, I think that you know I think that's you know we've got lots of time to, to to really get into it. And compared to my knowledge of descriptive psychology, which I would characterize as um, as uh, developing, but still at at, it, at its start, there's a I recognize and acknowledge the great deal of wisdom in the room when it comes to descriptive psychology, and I, I very much welcome your input. Um, because I do have my foot in two worlds, um, increasingly in descriptive psychology, but I, I, was, I was educated in like the engine room of mainstream social psychology. That's what the University of Waterloo is. And so that, that's where I'm coming from, and I'm transitioning into descriptive, and I see so much value in it. And this is my attempt to, uh, to, to use my knowledge of both worlds to hopefully help out this society, which um, is such a good and wonderful thing, um, but its membership is declining and we need new blood. And I think I might have some ideas about how to get it. 
So overview. So yeah, let, let me, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, on, that, on that topic, um, I want to mention that this, this talk is being recorded. And so I do, I do have in mind a number of audiences. I'm, I'm talking to the, those assembled uh, folks who have a background in descriptive psychology. Um, not everybody who's looking at this talk today has that background. People are coming from, from different research traditions. I think some of my students are in the call right now as well, and they're not descriptive psychologists. So I do have two audiences. And so the, the, the talk I think is going to have that character where sometimes I'll be talking to, to descriptive psychologists about things that are happening and have happened in mainstream, so-called mainstream psychology. Um, and then other times I'll be talking um, to, to folks who are maybe less familiar with descriptive psychology. So it's, um, I think it, it's, a, it's, an, it, it's, it's an intentional design, but I think it might, it might, it might, might be a little bit clunky in, in parts. We'll see. Okay. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk to you about my favorite topic uh, af after that. Um, next, actually, then I'm going to uh, talk to you about the signs of change that I'm seeing and that have occurred in the last number of years within um, mainstream psychology. Always just kind of imagine the air quotes over that. Um, then I'm going to talk about, so, and those signs of change are uh, people are starting to use better statistical tools correctly, which doesn't sound all that impressive, but actually kind of is once I get into it. I hope, I hope you understand why I think it is. Um, I'll talk to you about openness and transparency and, and what a radical change that is for psychology. And also a move towards coherent theoretical approaches in mainstream psychology, something that's arguably been lacking for some time, but I'm seeing some promise there. Um, then I'll talk to you about my three-pronged strategy for bringing descriptive into the mainstream and having people learn about descriptive and start to use it in their work and therefore make psychology a better thing and also hopefully increase our membership and then maybe the next time I give a talk like this, it will be, you know, in a bigger room. Who knows? Okay. Um, so, and I think the three-prong strategy, and I'm going to really be inviting a lot of folks input on this, is going to be to demonstrate the benefits of conceptual investigation, conceptual analysis, and the like. Um, advice on uh, teaching the basics and what I, how I think we can do that. And also my recommendation that we uh, use the maxims uh, publicly and often. I have my favorite maxims, I'm sure all you do too, and we can share about what our favorite maxims are and when we use them in our, our everyday work and, and personal lives. Okay. Questions so far? Like I'm open to, nope. Oh, it's just the overview, right? Not too many questions. So uh, let me first tell you about my favorite topic, me. Uh, uh, this, so, so if anybody wants to do this, it doesn't cost much money. You can get yourself Simpsonized. Uh, I just, and also, by the way, it wasn't intentional. I just realized that I'm wearing the exact same shirt that, <laughs> that's, that's, in that, that's in that picture. Um, so yeah, the, 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 this talk, I mean, this talk is, is about, about mainstream psychology and about descriptive, but it's, but it, you know, it's really, it's, it's me, right? Like I, this is, this is the world as I experience it with respect to where psychology is at and where I think it can go. Um, so I just kind of want to be up, up front about that. And this is, um, what's going to come through probably as I give this talk is this talk is reflective of a, of an intellectual journey that I began probably in about 2014 or so until, I stumbled across descriptive and talked to Ralph and then to Ray and then to T in about in 2017 and about how things have gone, gone since then. And what an absolute revelation. And to be honest, probably intellectual savior for me, descriptive has been and what the society has been for me. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's turn down the, the heat a little bit and talk about everybody's least favorite topic Null hypothesis significance testing. This is gonna this is gonna be taking people back quite a ways. I'm sure. Ra raise your hand if you never sat through a statistics lecture in university. Okay, so Joe never did because he was smart and he was a computer scientist. He's a computer scientist. Okay. I, you know what? You 
it's stiff competition with statisticians because they probably hate it more than you do. But anyways, okay. Uh, but but even Jason did not raise his hand. Even he's been through a statistics. All right. So let me just remind you um, of some things here. So okay. Well, actually, this isn't a reminder. This is going to be a, come as a surprise to some folks. Um, in 1967, Paul Meal, clinical psychologist, said that. NHST is a potent but sterile intellectual rake who leaves in his merry path a long train of ravished maidens, but no viable scientific offspring. Keep in mind, it was 1967, uh, and Meal did have kind of a flair uh, for, 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 the, for hyperbole. Um, he wasn't the first time to say this. People have been saying this for years before, probably beginning immediately post-Fisher, probably sometime in the 40s. Jacob Cohen, uh, in 1994, in his famous article, The Earth is Round, P is less than 0.05, says that NHST has not only failed to support the advance of psychology as a science, but also has seriously impeded, impeded it. This was published in The American Psychologist. Okay? This is a major statistician saying, Mino like. Then, the American st statistician, the, uh, uh, an organ of the American Statistical Association in 2019, the editorial said, don't say statistically significant. That's how bad this thing is. Yet it's used, well, it's used less and less, and that's going to be my point, but it, it's, it's been used extensively for years and years and years. And when I read Cohen's article, I thought, great, things are going to change. There was even an APA task force in 1997 that said, ah, maybe not so much with NHST, everybody. Didn't change a thing. Okay, so why are they saying this? Really brief, because I didn't come all this way to be with my friends and colleagues to give them a statistics lecture. That wouldn't be nice, and Joe might leave. So um, very briefly, this is a typical lecture slide that you would encounter when you are in a statistics course. Sorry, Joe, I'm giving you a statistic lecture now. <laughs> so to remind you, what you do in null hypothesis significance testing is you assume the null hypothesis that nothing's going on. Then you find out how the data would behave if the null hypothesis were true. Then you locate your data point, usually a mean, on that distribution. If it's if it's there, if it's if it's uh, under the meteor part of the curve, you say, ah, well, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, um, this this data point um, would you know happen often enough for me to decide that the null hypothesis very well can't be set aside. Um, but if if uh, you get a little bit lucky, and it really does turn out that you get a little bit lucky a lot of the time uh, for this to be the case. If it pops over here, you go, oh, well, this really wouldn't happen all that often when assuming the null hypothesis to be true. So I'm going to go ahead and dispense with the null hypothesis. This is all, is this ringing bells? This is coming back for people. I apologize for that. Uh, exactly. Um, hap, hap, for those of you who can see, I'm just made a blow my head off um, uh, gesture, which is about, which is, which is which is about right, and of course you know I've ha I've had to teach this, I've had to I've had to learn this, and and it you know it gets talked about about all the time. Okay, so what's the problem? Okay, so because this the idea here is that you're trying to exploit syllogistic logic, but you can't do it when you're using probabilities, and everybody knows this, but everybody continues just to pretend that it doesn't matter, but it really kind of does. Okay, so here's a cogent and correct syllogism. Okay, and Laurie, this is where you and Ray come in for a little bit. Okay. Because I had to pick on someone. Okay. Um, here is a cogent and correct syllogism. Okay. If a person is a Vulcan, he, she is not a descriptive psychologist. True, right? We have no Vulcans among us. If we were to encounter a Vulcan, not a descriptive psychologist. <laughs> An implicit descriptive psychologist, perhaps. For purposes of the lecture, so it, it would so this would no longer be a correct syllogism in Joe's estimation. It would only be a cogent one. Fine. Okay. This person is a descriptive psychologist, namely Lori. In this case, 
therefore this person is not a Vulcan, right? This is a cogent syllogism. I, we've got a major premise, a minor premise. The conclusion is correct. It's also correct. Okay. So what's the problem with doing it probabilistically? Here's the problem with it. If a person is an adult, he, she is probably not a descriptive psychologist, right? If you think of all the adults in the world, most of them, if you were to pick one at random, not a descriptive psychologist. This person is a descriptive psychologist, therefore this person is not an adult. It, it, just, it, it, it just doesn't work. As soon as, you, uh, as soon as you put that sneaky little word in there, probably, it just doesn't work anymore. You can't use modus, modus tollens, which is, the formal, uh, which, is the, which is the form of the syllogism. You can't use uh, modus tollens when you have probabilities, and this is an extreme example of why. You can't do so, and as you can see, it's making Dr. McCoy rather upset. Okay, okay. So it's it's just bad logic. Everybody knows this. So what's so what's going on here, right? It's it's terrible logic. Everybody knows not to use it, and yet it's still it's still used, or it's and it's it's still used now, but it's used less so, which is kind of my point. Oh, and just to make things up to Ray and Lori, the Ray and Lori recently had their fiftieth wedding anniversary. This is when they were first married in 19, 1970. 72, 1972, and here they are now. Um, I found these online, everyone. So they're they're. You can find anything online. <laughs> it's a good point. Um, so congratulations, uh, Ray and Lori, on the fiftieth. Okay. So um, also p values, which are part of NHST, they don't have. You can use them independent of NHST. They're also not great, and they're used all the time too. Why? Because they're sample size sensitive. We all know this. If you don't, what were you told? You don't have a, your p value isn't low enough, run more people, right? That's how you get a low, a low p value. You just shrink that sampling distribution really, really narrow. So they're sample size sensitive. That's not, that's not great. They don't, p values don't tell you what the sample size was, though, in any re, uh, realistic way. Problematic assumptions, you have to assume that you've randomly sampled from a population. You also have, assume, have to assume that there are no censored data. That is, you, you gathered all the data you expected to gather. In fact, it's worse. It turns out that even if you think you gathered all the data that you uh, intended to gather, if you, um, if you didn't know about some data that you were supposed to gather that you didn't end up gathering, that can also screw you too, okay? So it's a terrible, terrible statistic. Although the American Statistical Association disagrees with me a little bit about that, I think it's, I just think it's terrible. Okay, so, and it also gives you no information about effect size, um, that which would be the equivalent of, of saying that both of the buildings pictured are tall. Obviously, one is much, much taller than, than the other. It's, it's not giving you a lot of information, and the information it's giving you is probably not great, and it's tied to a problematic technique. Okay, so, okay, so, you know, and this has been going on for years and years and years. It drives statisticians and methodologists bananas that people don't understand this and that they use NHST willy-nilly and that they use p-values willy-nilly and the like. Okay, so, you know, Bob Dylan's aged really well, actually, hasn't he? Okay, anyway. Um, but here's the thing, though. Th things, are, things are changing now. There's something called the new statistics, uh, which is being um, uh, kind of captained by uh, a guy named Jeff Cumming. He's emphasizing effect sizes. So in Jeff Cumming's new statistics world, those two buildings just aren't characterized as tall. You say how tall each of them is, with one being much, much taller than the other one. That's a, that's a really big step. You think we could have done that a little bit earlier in our in the history of the discipline, but nonetheless, that's a really good idea. Um, you can also put confidence intervals now, and people will understand what you're doing. So you can say the effect size is yay, is you know is yay big, and I'm this confident that, that it actually is that size, or I'm this you know I'm not very confident. I have a very wide confidence interval around it. It could be anywhere between 10 feet tall and 150 feet tall, versus I think it's anywhere between 80 and 100 feet tall, right? which is much, much uh, better, obviously, and useful information that the old approach really didn't take into account. Um, there's also emerging um, an increasing emphasis on replication, getting a result more than once, more than twice as well. Um, and also an emphasis, whoops, whoa, whoa, I went really fast there. There's also an emphasis on meta-analysis, that is um, doing a number of replications and then looking at all of them to see 
what the general trend is. So instead of conducting one study to conclude that something is the case and maybe sometimes being right, often being wrong, and probably getting a little bit lucky, um, now you have to do something over and over and over again. Different labs have to do it, and you have to do a meta-analysis to say, look, this might be a thing. And here is an example, a kind of an interesting example. So I'm not going to go into the technical aspects here, but I think you'll kind of get the point. There is there's a there's a, a number line at the bottom that's showing a standard uh, effect size. The, the big diamond at the bottom is the summary of all of those different experiments that were done, trying the very, very same thing. Those are all the confidence intervals around each of the effects from each of the experiments. And this is showing that there's a, um, a more medium effect size for something called overall meta-analytically called the verbal overshadowing effect. Um, the verbal overshadowing effect is actually kind of interesting. It has to do with the idea that if you witness a crime and you, you immediately or after a delay describe what the criminal looked like, you're much less likely to pick them out of a lineup than if you don't say anything at all. Uh, what, which, that's kind of interesting, right? The other kind of interesting thing about it is the guy who originally found the effect, Jonathan Schooler, um, in my opinion, started to, tend to, to detach himself from reality a little bit because when he found that he couldn't replicate this effect, he concluded that what was happening is that the collective unconscious was correcting um, for the effect and eliminating it from, from civilization. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, so it takes all kinds, right? Um, but nonetheless, um, it, we, it, they actually managed to show that it's a thing, um, that there is a verbal overshadowing effect. So there we go. So, um, so that's a really, that's a really great development. So why am I, why am I encouraged by this? Like you, some of you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? You're using a different statistical tool. It looks a little bit better to me, but what's the big deal? Um, here's the big deal. Significance testing was done for decades, af you know, decade after decade after decade, despite the fact that statisticians were warning us, telling us, don't do this, it's terrible. Geeker Renzer called NHST the permanent illusion because he didn't think it would ever go away. It's just too, it's just too tempting for people. There's also, um, and relatedly, there's a problem of statistical literacy in our, in our discipline as well. People after they leave, working researchers after they leave graduate school, rarely take refreshers in statistics, don't tend to teach statistics, leave it to experts, and quickly forget things that they really, really need to know in order to conduct their analyses properly, and they rely on software to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, those are two pretty big um, forces going against us. Um, but nonetheless, things are changing, and they're moving towards a better a better toolbox. And it's not just one tool for another. It's not just another hammer. This is a change in mindset because people are starting to think beyond one study. They're starting to think about study after study after study, replication after replication after replication. They're starting to collaborate across labs instead of competing with each other. There, we would say that there, there is a substantial changes in the social practices within the discipline. Okay, um, And it's ha it happened relatively quickly and it's happened recently even though it's been talked about for years. So there seems to be something happening where there is um, there's more potential for change now than there has been for some time in our discipline. So it's like you go from black and white Kansas to us, right? Like it really is, for me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, really, it's a really big change. Okay. All right. But that's not all. Okay. So, in 2011, a study, uh, a paper came out by Simmons and his friends, when, in which they talked about something called false positive psychology, and they used regular methodological practices to come up with the following conclusion in their analyses. According to their birth dates, people were nearly a year and a half younger after listening to When I'm 64 rather than to Kalimba. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know that song, but um, of course that's just, that's just ridiculous, right? So how, how, could that, how could that be the case? How could you randomly assign people to listen to When I'm 64 or to Kalimba? And, and then suddenly um, people are, are a year and a half younger in one group than, uh, than, than another. 
that's that's just nonsense. Well, it turns out that what they didn't do was they didn't tell you everything that they did. But here's the thing. That's been common practice in psychology for some time, not telling your reader all the things you did, all the conditions you ran, all the measures that you had. There was another there was another song condition. I think it was a song by the Wiggles. I think it was Hot Potato by the Wiggles, if I'm remembering correctly. A good song, um, but it didn't produce any effects, so they dropped it. Um, also, they asked more than one question. They uh, they also uh, they also asked about how old do you feel and a couple of other questions as well. So this is just chance, right? This is just chance. Random assignment doesn't always work, and so you got this uh, you got this kind of fluky difference between the groups that suddenly it looks uh, all big and important because you deleted um, you know uh, very very important information about what you did. But this is common practice. This is the common practice that also got Ben able to publish an article in a very major journal in in psychology claiming that ESP is real. Okay, um, because Hmm? What's that? <laughs> oh, we'll have to talk. Great. <laughs> I, 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 I've met Daryl. I, I, I love, I love him the bit, but I mean, he's, he, you know, but he's all, but, but he's, he's, a, he's, a, oh, he's, as you well know, he's also a magician. Yep. And he's a good one. And he knows how to hide things and how to have you not pay attention to things. Yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is this is uh, this is uh, sometimes called p hacking, where people take different different hacks to see if they can get their their p level um, less than 0.05 and conclude that something's significant. But we've already talked about that. Okay. Um, so this is a, this is a so p hacking though is a really good explanation for something called the replication crisis. This made major news uh, a number of years ago. There were um, articles written in places like um, Harper's. Near, you know, I'm forgetting all the places. It was, but it, it was all over, over the place. It even made John Oliver's last week tonight, in which he did a whole expose on on p hacking and the problem with with replication in psychology. A problem that other disciplines have too, including um, neuroscience, economics. Um, uh, what, what medical medical research. John Ionid has published an article called "Why Most Published um, uh, Findings Are, are False," um, and because because of the, the the increasing recognition of the replication crisis. Okay, so what is the replication crisis? So the replication crisis happened for, because established effects like the ego depletion effect were shown to be not replicable. What's the ego depletion effect? If you watched Good Morning America or you picked up a popular article in the last 10, 15 years. Um, you have heard about the ego depletion effect. If you, you know, if you, you know, expand your self-control doing one thing, then you have less left over for something else, right? This has appeared in in, in major self-help books and everything like that. Um, attempts to replicate it fall absolutely flat. Doesn't seem to be a thing. Um, the facial feedback hypothesis. Those of you who maybe read a little bit more, more esoterically might have heard about a study where you get participants to put a pen in their mouth and either have them either have them smile or grimace, and then you have them watch a comedy program, and the people who uh, were, were, uh, had, the, had the smiling uh, face, you know, were, who were smiling, uh, found, the, uh, found the comedy program to be more humorous than the people who were frowning. Um, why would anyone ever do this? But anyways, um, it, no, it doesn't, it doesn't replicate. Uh, this upsets the, uh, the prima donnas who ran these things, by the way. Um, there's also the mor moral reminders effect, which is given people an opportunity to cheat, they will, unless you um, remind them of the Ten Commandments, then they'll be less likely to cheat. No, it doesn't happen. In fact, if you try to replicate it and you do it enough times, you actually get the reverse effect. The Ten Commandments effect tends to make people want to cheat a little bit more. Don't ask me why, okay? Uh, what's that? There you go. There you go. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so all of a sudden, um, when people tried to get um, popular effects in social psychology, and then systematic efforts to get them were constantly falling, probably because of Probably because they weren't 
single condition. Okay. As you might imagine, when these things didn't replicate, what what did you think was you know what what do we think was going to happen? Do you think that the people who published these things and are patients said, oh well, bad on. <laughs> who should have known better lecturing a statistician on how this didn't understand confidence string didn't understand it um, thing, uh, thing things like a uh, researcher accusing the people who couldn't replicate him um, a researcher's flair and that's why the studies were not, were not replicating they they were just they weren't artists um, and then of course just just bald face Remember the old days when there'd be uh, like the, 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 the there we go. Thank you. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, so the usual kinds of reactions. And of course there, there are major, there are major economic and otherwise incentives in place to have people engage in these questionable research practices. They need to publish, they need to get tenure, they need to get grants. No one wants to know about null findings. So again, major, major forces that, um, that would tend to maintain the status quo, which is, which is, in my opinion, bad science. Nonetheless, things are changing. There's real change happening. So uh, one of the first things that happened was the Open Science Foundation got established. A bunch of folks got together and said, um, you, you want credibility? You share all of your methods, all of your data, all of your analyses, everything that you do. Um, put it in the Open Science Foundation, and when you go to publish, include a link, include a DOI to the stuff in the Open Science Foundation so everybody can see everything that you did. No more hiding. No more hiding anything. This is a, this is a major step. If you think about how possessive and, and um, secretive people were about their data and their analytic practices and their methodologies compared to sharing everything openly, this is a, this is a major change. Um, along with that came some badges that you can get from open science for having open data, for having, having open materials, and also for pre-registering hypotheses. Increasingly in our discipline, if you want to be taken seriously as having hypothesized something, you actually have to hypothesize it before you collect the data. You actually have to say, I think, I, I think that this is going to happen. Um, as opposed to getting your data and going, oh, look, I knew that was going to happen. Um, so those, those badges are popular, and we know that they are incentives, and we know that people want them, and we know um, that there has been significant uptake of them when journals um, uh, give you the opportunity to advertise the fact that you have those badges. The other thing that's happening, by the way, great book. If you haven't read it, A Tenured Professor by, by John Kenneth Galbraith, a really, a really fun book. Um, increasingly now, when people are assessed for going up for tenure and promotion, university uh, tenure and promotion boards will solicit feedback from experts in openness and transparency to get an opinion from them with respect to what, uh, how good these researchers are with respect to open and transparent uh, practices. Why? Well, it's certainly the way the discipline is going, but no, no universities want to wear another fraud case, and there are fraud cases, and so they, and so they want to be on the other end of it. They want to be on the, look at this, this person is so great. Um, also, something has come along called registered replication reports in a major psychological journal called Perspectives on Psychological Science. <laughs> Excuse me. I do not have COVID. I tested. 
Um, and this has been an absolute revelation. Now, um, what, when there's interest in, in replicating something, dozens and dozens of labs try, try to replicate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. So let me give you. Here we go. I've got some, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, what happened there? Okay, okay, so okay. So what, right? A lot of you are saying, well, that's great, Ian. You told me about all sorts of one, good and wonderful developments in, in, um, in, in mainstream psychology. That, that, that's, 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 that's good and wonderful. It looks like they're cleaning up their, uh, cleaning up their shop with, with respect to their statistical practices and their methodology, but that only takes us so far. Right, that only only takes us so far. There, there are some other problems with mainstream psychology that aren't touched by these kinds of changes. Right? What you know, where is the theory? You know, what about their concepts? That's where that's where we live as descriptive, as descriptive psychologists. Because right now we could walk, you could walk away from this going, um, it's kind of like this. Right? Okay, so what? So there's more. There's actually more. They, they're moving beyond methods. We know that mainstream psychologists love method, right? They love talking about statistics and particular methods and, and what's, what's, the, you know, what's the coolest new tool and all those kinds of things. But it's going deeper than that. I don't know if it's as developed as the other innovations. That's not terribly surprising, but there is movement. Um, for example, um, there's some thinking about different kinds of theory. Really interesting article about two different kinds of theory, uh, what psychology can learn from Einstein. And most psychologists are probably kind of shaking their heads going, what do you mean what we can, what we can learn from Einstein? But Einstein had a really interesting um, uh, dichotomous ta taxonomy of theories, um, theories of principle and uh, constructive theories. Uh, constructive theories are what psychologists do, all about mechanism, you know, what, you know, you know, what drives what drives what, you know, ult ultimate cause, those kinds of things versus theories of principle are more about um, uh, finding symmetries about things that, that go together. So his, ironically, uh, although he had less regard for them, um, Einstein's um, uh, theories of special and general relativity are actually theories of principle, uh, just about, about how things hang, hang together with respect to um, how, how, so, you know, how, um, how things behave as you approach the speed of light. How, how time dilates and how mass increases and, and all, that, all that kind of thing. The, no mechanistic explanation there. But that, that's kind of interesting, right? And it's opening a door to suggest to some psychologists that they might want to crawl before they can walk. They might want to think about theories of principle before they start getting into deep explanatory theories, which seems to, which seems to be where, where folks want to live. Uh, here's a particular explanatory theory uh, or constructive theory. Uh, it's not appearing for me. There it is. Um, so the, the, uh, J Joe Heinrich is a, is, a, is a really big player in, in psychology, and he, along with his uh, colleague, wrote a very important paper in uh, Nature Human Behavior called The Problem in Theory, in which they basically complained about how, how psychology does not have great theories, right? How the, the concepts are loose, they don't tend to hang together very well, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, we, we need big theoretical frameworks. They have a particular theoretical framework that they're pushing from an evolutionary perspective called dual inheritance theory. Fine, maybe we don't like that one. But nonetheless, the idea is they're pushing towards um, having coherent, uh, 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 well-articulated uh, theoretical frameworks that should drive programs of research as opposed to theory simply being a convenience, right? So where you can have Cognitive dissonance theory, for example, uh, range from, uh, it doesn't matter if the cognitions are relevant to the self. Oh, wait a second, it does. Oh, wait a second, maybe it doesn't. Um, and oh, by the way, you don't even have to, you don't even have to be conscious of them, or, or actually maybe you do, uh, right? Um, that, you know, which is kind of the, his, that, that's the potted history of, of the theory of cognitive dissonance, because I've lived that, that one. Um, so there, there seems to be some movement there where people are, are, are um, are pushing towards a more coherent theoretical approaches. This is starting to feel a little bit meatier to me, right? That maybe descriptive psychology can actually make a difference here if people are actually gonna start to pay attention to the kinds of theories 
that they're constructing as opposed to them being explanatory conveniences with no, um, but only retroactive explanatory conveniences with no real predictive power, as opposed to even Einstein's theory of general relativity, which made a bunch of people go to the South Pole and then to some islands somewhere, I'm forgetting where, to, to look at an eclipse. Okay. Okay, so taken together, I think that this is actually a remarkable period of critical self-reflection in mainstream psychology. I, um, th those of you who've been in psychology longer than me, or and maybe have studied the history of psychology, could point to another time, maybe the cognitive revolution. But they, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, to have those three things happening around the same time in concert, I think, really is opening up uh, an opportunity. Uh, to insert ourselves into a discussion. So if there ever was a time, I think it's now. It's like we're moving from two-dimensional Homer. It's like we move from early Homer to later Homer, and then now Homer's 3D, right? He's at, I think I, it's that, that, kind of, that kind of potential. I'm sensing we don't have a lot of Simpsons fans in the audience. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that was, that was cute. well, it's still Homer, but three-dimensional, extra dimension, extra dimension. <laughs> psychology true okay so what should we do right what am i doing for time no no i'm a little bit short well we'll have lots of time for, for chatting um <clears throat> what should we do we have some choices to make we have and we have because we can't do everything but what are some of the ideas i've come up with and i'm very open to hearing yours as well so the first thing i think we should do is we should start to um as much as we can talk to other people who aren't familiar with descriptive psychology about the importance of concepts, because that's what really seems to be missing from what's happened so far, right? So if you think about what, uh, what Machado calls the epistemic triangle, which is um, data, theory, and concepts, psychologists are getting way, way better at getting data and, and, and being open about how they get it. Um, they're starting to come around about theory and about having good theory, but concepts, we know that's a, that's a problem, right? We, we, we know that they play fast and loose with concepts in psychology all the time. And so I think that there's some work that we can do there. And I have a little bit more to say about that. Um, teaching, I think there, there's a lot that can be done there that's related to conceptual analysis, but we also have to ask ourselves the question, what are we gonna teach? I'll tell you about what I've been teaching that seems to be resonant with senior undergraduates, but I'm sure everybody has some ideas as well. And then use the maxims publicly and often. I've been using them to myself, with, with myself, and I've also been saying them to others. And they do seem to have resonance. They do seem to help people understand persons in the world. Okay, so a little bit more about each of these, and then I'm going to open it up. So we really do need to focus on one of our strengths, concepts, which I would argue is the poorest cousin in psychology. The, 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 the second poorest cousin being theory. That's Billy Piper who played Fanny Price in Mansfield Park. Those of you who know the novel, Fanny Price was the poor cousin who went to, right, right, okay, fine. Okay, um, and there, there, and uh, for those of you who are familiar with Ray's articles, you'll, you'll know why I put vertebrates in there um, because of Ray's wonderful example of a student going to the first class in a vertebrates class and being told, um, we're, gonna be study, we're gonna be studying vertebrates. By the way, nobody can agree on what a vertebrate is. Um, so I think that one of the things that we can focus on with people is we can start out in our various ways when we get the opportunity to point out that conceptual clarity is not a convenience. It's not, you know, we're not being picky. It's not esoteric. It's essential to the proper operation of the scientific discipline, period. And you can start to show them Examples, and examples abound. I've written about a particular example with respect to daydreaming. There are so many examples out there. Uh, one within clinical psychology that I was looking into is resilience. There are so many different definitions of resilience. The mind boggles. Conservatism, political conservatism is another one where there are so many different um, conceptualizations as well. And you can show people how a, discipline, uh, a, a particular field of study within psychology can get stalled when you don't use concepts uh, in, a, um, in a coherent way, um, in a, in a self-aware way, even I, I would argue. Um, 
And we can also showcase our tools. We, we have conceptual tools within Descriptive that are extremely helpful. Um, we can show them paradigm case formulations and parametric analyses and some of our other conceptual tools as well. And, and uh, I have found that to be extremely useful in my conversations with fellow psychologists, explaining, for example, the power of a paradigm case formulation in um, translating um, a, com uh, a complex phenomenon into something that is, uh, can be delineated with a PCF and can actually be coded uh, for data uh, using a PCF as well. Um, and it, it often comes as a revelation to them in there. And uh, they're, I just had a discussion with a job candidate on the very topic this week. Um, so yeah, people are receptive. This really does seem to, uh, to work a lot. And I encourage you in all of your ways, um, in, all of, in, in your various professions in everyday life to think about how you, you can do this, how you can, uh, um, you, you, can, you can point this out. One thing that you're gonna have to do though is point out that um, you're not having a discussion about um, whether or not um, conservatism is something or not. You have to have a discussion about whether or not it's a useful way to conceptualize something or not, which is uh, something that I think um, practicing research psychologists have a lot of trouble with. They think you're having an argument about what something is as opposed to how to think about something. Um, and uh, I often use the unicorn example. Unicorns don't exist, but we can still have a really nice concept of a unicorn and you can come up with that. Um, students. Exactly. Right. Thank you, Greg. That is so well put. No, no one online, no one online could hear you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to give him the mic. I'll repeat it. If you don't, it, I just want to make sure I'm doing it correctly. If you don't have a concept of a unicorn, you can't determine whether or not it exists or not. You can't even talk about it. You can't even talk about it. Thank you, Greg. That, that is a really nice problem as a, a way of putting it. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got a problem of, like, of legacy and descriptive psychology. This is an interesting problem. Most academic societies don't have the problem that we have because uh, of the fact that uh, societies like ours tend, tend to have um, a higher percentage of people who are in academe who have intellectual progeny who they send out into the world, right? Who then who then have their own intellectual progeny. So I can, I can trace myself back to Lewin in, in three generations for, for, for example. We don't, we don't have that situation in our society because um, so many people who were um, uh, at the founding of or near the founding of this, this society went on to become practicing clinicians and had clients and helped them um, be mentally healthy. You know, great, um, obviously very, very important work, but you didn't, you, not a lot of you have intellectual offspring, and therefore there's a tendency for our membership to decline over time and the like. So we need, we need people, I don't, like, I'm describing the obvious here, right? I don't think this is coming as a surprise to anybody, but we, we, we need people, uh, we need new people to come in. And, and um, so how do we do that? Well, we got, we've got to, we've got to preach. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to find students and we've got to talk to them about how good and wonderful descriptive is. Um, so what I found works well is the, one of the challenges of descriptive psychology is it, it can get complicated uh, quickly, arguably too quickly, if you're not careful. So how do you do this? You, 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 know, you pick the low hanging fruit. You, you teach the senior undergrads and the grads the, the basics. This has worked extreme, extremely well for me the last couple of years uh, in, in a course I've taught at the University of, of Guelph. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about my own course. So in my own course, we, uh, we read a number of descriptive psychologists right out of advances and um, other places as well. So there's, there's Jean's uh, wonderful chapter on guilty or not involving, um, involving the, 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 ki the killing of that abusive uh, former spouse, I believe it was, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, and, and about her descriptive psychological analysis of what was happening there with respect to intentional action and and, and, and the like. Um, there's, uh, there's also uh, Ray's wonderful paper, uh, the, Tolstoy, the Tolstoy Dilemma in Advances. Uh, there's um, Tony Putnam's article on um, ordinary magic, which really seems to resonate uh, on so many different levels with, with students. Um, they've never really thought about things that way before. Um, and also it gives me an opportunity to make it relevant to their lives. I asked them about, well, what's your ordinary magic? 
um, which is actually quite affirming. Um, for the sometimes you might have some some folks who are reluctant to talk about their ordinary magic. Really easy trick. Simply ask them, "What do your friends think your ordinary magic is? What would your friends say?" And that seems to kind of op open them up. Um, but those are accessible. Uh, uh, those are really accessible. Um, uh, what else? And also, they they read um, uh, Ray's article, uh, "What is uh, What is the Self," uh, which they they really enjoy. And also, the one that knocks box cognition out of the water um, within the first few paragraphs uh, that Ray wrote is also a really good one. And there's so many more things that I could be assigning. I almost made the course all about descriptive, but I thought that that might be a, a, a bit too adventurous, but maybe in the future. So, but I'm sure we can all think of, um, you know, different examples we can, uh, we can bring to the right audiences to, to help them get in touch with the power of, of, this, of this discipline. Uh, more advanced students um, in my lab, I talk them through the advantages of uh, paradigm case formulations with respect to being able to think about phenomena well. Right now, I have um, I've had a series of undergraduates come up with a comprehensive taxonomy of uh, of conscious thought with um, uh, using paradigm case uh, formulations for different varieties of, of conscious thought. Um, you know, and they they catch on to it really quickly. Not that they don't make mistakes, but they catch on it to it really quickly. They also uh, really do enjoy um, the, the power of parametric analyses as well, especially the uh, the idea of um, um, thinking being a kind of behavior, which comes as a bit of a revelation to them as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, they also very much enjoy uh, Osorio's work um, out of nowhere uh, about, about how thinking works, um, uh, an absolute revelation to them as well, because you see them realizing that what they're reading just makes so much sense to them, I think is a big part of this. And they're so used to reading psychology where what they're reading isn't really kind of landing with them because it seems to be talking, um, it doesn't seem to be talking about persons it's in, a, in a kind of an odd way, right? And um, you really do see the, light, the lights go on with them. And so, yeah, find students and teach them this stuff. It works. And by the way, I'm not trying to suggest by any means that none of you have been not doing any of these things. I'm just talking about the things that I think would work and I'm just encouraging people maybe haven't do, been doing some things to do more of them um, <clears throat> or to do, to do them a bit and maybe more of them if you've already been doing them. Um, from, yeah, from my own research, I've already talked about the development of the taxonomy of, of conscious thought uh, and the powerfulness of, um, of descriptive uh, tools in that, in that endeavor. Uh, and finally, um, a couple of maxims um, that, that I very much, much like and I use in my regular life and I tell my, my students about that, that help me Think about persons better, I would argue. Um, my favorite one, the world makes sense, and so do people. They make sense now. Um, again, this should be obvious. I think it's probably you know, obvious to everybody in this room. But whenever I'm confronted by a behavior by someone and I go, what is going on here? Why is this person doing this? If I remember that maxim, that the world makes sense and so do people, they make sense now, I start to think about, well, how does this behavior make sense? sense and it's and you have that kind of like tingly you know back of the head moment that sometimes you get when when you're when you're doing this kind of work where you suddenly realize yes now now i'm on to something now i'm starting to understand something not that i necessarily agree with what the person did or understand them fully but i'm on that i'm on that journey i mean the other one that i that i um have started to use now as well especially in university politics during a budget crunch and COVID and all that. If a situation calls for a person to do something they can't do, they'll do something they can do. And just a reminder, as Wim Schwartz very nicely put in his blog post that I was just rereading today, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be doing their best, but they're, they're but they're going to do something. There's there are going to be opportunities that they're going to be uh, uh, that they're going to be available to them that they're going to pursue when they can't. And do something. This one also really does resonate with people as well um, because they'll say, well, they didn't do this, but they did this. I go, well, you know, if they, if they can't do that, then they're going to do something. I guess that's what they, I guess that's what they did instead. Um, and, uh, and, but there are so many more maxims and I invite you to think about your own and I, I invite your, I invite your input. 
And um, oh boy, do we have to take a half a credit away, Dave? Because we're not gonna. Do we have to take a half a credit away because I only went for an hour? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Let's discuss. Right, half. Yeah, yeah. I mind like a steel trap. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As, as someone in my gliding club said about a, about a uh, about a uh, I think this is a dog, uh, <laughs> or a dog that looked like this said an excellent an ex an excellent lift to drag ratio. Uh, yeah, Ray. So just to remind you, I'm going to bring the the microphone around so everybody on Zoom can hear you. So if one of your students asks you, they say, well. Why do we have to clarify concepts? I mean, we all know what a motive is. We all know what behavior is. We all know what a person is. What's, you know, we know how to use these words. Why do we need, this is what I think is the prevailing right. attitude. Yes, there. yes, you know, yeah. So, so you're off, you, so a student asks you this, what do you, what do you tell them? Right, so I'm gonna preface it by saying, I think that this is a problem that is arguably unique to psychology because of our contact of how much contact are the study of what we study with with everyday language i and I, so i think that's really the crux of the matter and why other disciplines don't necessarily have the same problem that we do what i would do in that case is i, I would actually uh, i would actually turn it back to them and i would say okay here's what we're going to do um there are 30 of you we're all we're going to get into six groups of five each group without looking at your phones without looking at a computer you're all going to come up with your own definitions of behavior you're all going to come up with your definitions of motive Oh, sorry. Oh, we're all we're all going to come up with our own definition. So I'm going to put them in small groups, and we're we're going to come up with our, our, our I'm going to get each group to come up with a definition of behavior, and or a definition of motive or what have you. And then I'm going to have them come back and share, and they're going to be way off of each other. I'm going to say that's why, that's why right there, because the problem in psychology is we 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 think we are all talking about the same thing, but we're not necessarily all talking about the same thing. In fact, I'm writing an article that's taking a while. Where I am, I actually open with the uh, Abbott and Costello routine. Who's on first? Because I, 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 I kind of really think that's where, wh how how bad it can be sometimes, where people think that they know what they're talking about, but they actually, they actually, get, they 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 don't. I want to suggest that you talked about what might additional things might be introduced. Right. Concepts uh, go hand in hand. With that, with what did you call it? Techniques, procedures. Sure. Math methods. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't remember. Um, and there's an important reason. Um, everything I've ever read in psychology that tries to talk about concepts does it with a stipulative definition. Right. Definitions don't work. And, and in fact, anybody who ever had a mathematical logic course, and many people here probably didn't. So let me tell you an exercise we went through when I was a junior. Uh, my professor said, okay, you all know the basics of mathematical logic. We had gone through the basics of it with quantifiers and, and propositional logic and all that. Okay, I want you to define the concept of chair. Uh, so of course, everyone said, well, it's got a place to sit and it's got four legs and a bat. And he says, okay, what about three legs? Um, well, what about no back? Oh, so we worked and we worked and we worked and we got all done until the whole class, this is like 20, 25 of us, we pretty happy with a formal, and I mean, this is a Caltech, formal mathematical definition of a chair. He says, what about a beanbag chair? <laughs> and we all went, oh, not everybody. <laughs> the room of undergraduate males, so you can imagine what we said. Um, and that, fundamental phenomenon is true of, as far as I can tell, every concept in the real world. Mm -hmm. You can't define table. You can't, de can't define pen. You can't define cell phone, for gosh sakes, probably the most common object in the world these days. Mm -hmm. Mathematical logic is great for defining concepts that are defined mathematically. Mm -hmm. So I can define the concept of a derivative in calculus. Right. And I can do it mathematically if I have to. But when it comes to defining things like regular things in the world, if you can't define chairs, 
you're in the soup if it comes to defining people. Oh yeah. Or behavior. So you need some some way to make your subject matter clear. And that's where paradigm case comes in. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about paradigm case behavior, paradigm case person. And when I've done that, it connects. I haven't done it, had occasion. Well, I've done it a little bit in a class. I uh, wasn't the focus of the class. I didn't have a chance to do it much. But it connects to people. They go, oh, yeah, right. You can't really define a person. But I understand what you mean by paradigm case person. Mm -hmm. like, okay. And in a tenth of a second, some bright boiled girl say, well, what about the non-paradigm cases? Mm -hmm. So we say, okay. Right. So we list them and we make variations and so forth. Uh, it, Pete once pointed out the pur purpose of those things is to bring clarity to the domain you want to talk about. Right. Um, definitions ain't going to do it. So anytime you want to do concepts, somebody's going to say, okay, you're so smart. How are you going to define the concept of a person? Mm -hmm. You better have it in your hip pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. But, and actually, I'll add, um, in psychology, if you ask someone how they're, how, they, how they're conceptualizing something, sometimes I say defining because they know what I mean. Although I take your point. I say define. I, I, say, I say define just as a shorthand because it kind of, right? What they end up telling me is how they measure it. That's how they measure it. Yeah, they tell, they, yeah, yeah. So that yeah, so that that'd be the 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 equivalent of, you know, of um, at, you know, asking me ask you know, someone asking a physicist what's what speed, and they say, well, let, get my get my car, I'll show you a speedometer, like it, right? It just, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. They're thinking operational definition. We're, 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 Everybody online, we're getting used to the new social practice of having to wait for the mic to come to us before I we think, talk. It's I think proving it's a, to be challenging. I think it's a perfect example of your your second maxim there. If people can't do what's what they <laughs> are called for, they do what they can do. Mm -hmm. So they come up with that kind of a definition. One thing I'm always uh, still is the case. It's two two things come to mind. Is uh, abnormal books and personality books. And they all tell you in the first chapter, um, well, we haven't come to any agreement at this point, but we've only had 150 years. Yeah. So very young science um, about what personality means. Yeah. And, and so, so some of the extreme ones. And so in each chapter, we will just go along with whatever that theorist says it is. And we'll, you know, and the next chapter might be different, but like, okay, same thing for uh, abnormal or psychopathology or mental disorder. They'll say we haven't, you don't have a consensus definitions. So here's some of the kinds of things. There's something called the, the four D's. You know, how um, much I'm blocking at the moment. Four different kinds of things. Ah, I'm not blocking on it, but anyway. So these are the kind of things you see, but they're just they don't begin to come to a definition. In fact. The book I use, they say, well, we have the four Ds. Now, here's the first one, uh, destructive or something like that. The behavior is destructive. Um, now, so that works sometimes, but it doesn't work other times. And, and they just go through all of it. And they, and they say, this works sometimes and not other times. And at the end, basically, they're saying, we don't have a clue. Yeah. We, don't, we can't capture this term. And I, I always think of somebody he or she has completed their new textbook and they send it to their mother and their mother's reading and she calls up and she says, um, honey, <laughs> you know, I don't understand something. It's a book about personality, but in the first chapter, you say you don't know what it is. Oh, someone's got a hand up. Who's that? That's that's Walter. Oh, on Zoom. Is it Walter? On Zoom. It's me. Yes. <laughs> Walter. Uh, yes. Um, you know, on the topic. I mean, it may be late in the game, but <clears throat> on the topic of um, of getting descriptive psychology across uh, to others, yeah, and even in the academic domain. 
Um, the, I think one of the problems has been that we rely uh, too much on observer critic, essentially articles and expositions of, of, of the concepts and not enough on actor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the actor domain that you get, well, action and you get engagement and you get um, people following through, um, moving on. And so um, one of the, um, one way, for example, is if, if we got into arguments, uh, arguments are a um, are actor domain, and it would be. I bet you that if you had um, uh, Ray in an argument with somebody else, um, that that would elicit a certain kind of curiosity and involvement, and basically, essentially, actor uh, actor behavior. Um, in relationship to descriptive psychology. Um, and by the way, it's one of the reasons why the empirical domain is also tends to elicit more involvement is because, you know, you're saying, hey, this actually happens here. So you get actors involved. But anyway, um, I would love to have our, our leading descriptive psychologists get into arguments with some people out there. So and arg arguments to be to be witnessed. Yes. Right. Yep. Yes. I mean, there are a real, you know, real fights. With boxing gloves on. <laughs> with, with 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 veiled insults, et cetera, you know. <laughs> I can't help but also comment, Walter, after you're saying this. As uh, Ian, you were up there giving your presentation, I couldn't help but get uh, kind of the impression that I was watching, you know, Patton sort of rally the troops for oh. psychologists to be. <laughs> and I thought it was something that, and I'm, and I'm just saying because of how like much I think, you know, you actually really hit the nail on the head in terms of where this stuff has so much value that's underutilized. And so it was really enthusiastic or uh, in, I feel really enthusiastic after watching your talk from well, uh, kind of a, a you yeah. know. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, another way of having an a way of having an argument is to take on somebody's take on something and to, you know, cut at it um, and to offer a replacement of of that, of the, uh, a replacement vision, a better vision. Uh, but again, that's that's an argument. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a, that's a good point. And I think I think one could, I think there, there's a good case to be made that perhaps, uh, no, actually, there's, there's a good case to be made that there's probably not enough um, live dialogue between, uh, between um, academics on a regular basis. If you think about the way most, um, you know, your point about, about papers, Walter, usually they come out without commentary, without rebuttal. Um, conferences, the, the, you know, when there's a panel, they're usually, you know, they kind of nice each other to death. Um, and um, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of um, uh, spirited debate, shall we say. So that's a point well taken. As for rallying the troops, thank you. Uh, thank you, Errol. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 um, I really meaning am, it in a collegial and competitively. Yeah, kind exactly. Of yeah, no, but I really no, no of course, of course, no, I am Canadian. Like yeah. it only goes so far. Yes, uh, but you know, like it's like it's like the old it's like the old joke. How do you how do you get a bunch of Canadians out of, out of a swimming pool? You say, come on, guys, get out of the pool. Uh, but uh, I always kill though. That's great, um, but. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I really am quite, quite passionate about this. I am, I am, honestly, a, a bit scared that 
you know, it, you know, I was I, I was reading I was reading an article in the in the Times Literary Supplement, and they talked about being in the, you know, going into the bowels of the Bodleian Library in in, in England, and just bearing witness to how many volumes, how many you know, how many life works, how many you know groups of lives works are are down there that no one that no one ever sees. Like this, this can happen. This can happen. This, 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 this can die off. And I think it would be a true tragedy. And so if you're, if you're, if you're seeing like a little bit of, you know, unusual, um, you know, kind of piss and vinegar from me on this one, uh, it's because I, yeah, I want people to get worked up about it and I want people to go out there and do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I am trying to. I hope my my voice is coming through. Yep, I'm, you, I'm yeah. very struck by um, Walter's suggestion that we need to have real time arguments that people witness. And in relation to that, I'd like to comment on the difference in social practices between hard scientists and social scientists. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw Paul and all these hotshot MIT people get into this wild, raging argument. And I was just sitting there in horror. At the end of which, you know, somebody said, oh, it's time to go. Let's go have a beer. And everybody's laughing and they go off and they have a beer and they have a wonderful time. And I said to Paul, if some psychologists had done that, they wouldn't speak to each other again. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of social practice psychology really gets in the way. Yeah, sometimes it's almost like there's an unspoken agreement. Um, if you if you don't if you don't uh, tread on my fiefdom, I won't I won't I won't tread on yours. Right. I, I think it's a huge. Um, it, it, it's a hugely detrimental social practice in, in our field. Thank you. We're, we're going to do uh, Greg and then CJ Peak. So, um, let me just hold it up. Well, yeah, let's turn. We pass it around. It's all journey now. Um, People can't hear you. What, what Car okay. Um, what Carolyn just said struck me. Uh, generally, this talk is like bringing me back to like late 70s at Cornell. Um, and especially the women at the seminars. Oh, never. Out because <laughs> we were arguing, like you said, psychologists. And we would argue like that, and then we would go out and have a good time. And I remember uh, Ulrich Neisser had purposely hired someone who theoretically disagreed with him so that he would have somebody to argue with. Mm -hmm. And so, and right. you're telling me about P values and our values, I'm going, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we were discussing this back in the late 70s. Yeah. A P value is like the ticket that got you in the door. Yeah. You know, Ooh. like that got you past the bouncer, but it, you know, it didn't mean you could boogie. <laughs> oh, well, it does and now. It's just like, well. yeah, we're well in the 21st century. And, you know, yeah. 